My name is Leslie Schlachter. I am a physician assistant at the Mount Sinai Hospital Department of Neurosurgery. I'm also the clinical director and the chief advanced practice provider. Right. The brain tumor grading system is based on a system called the World Health Organization grading system. And that's a scale from one to four. It's very different than what most people think of as a staging system. A staging system for most uh, cancers or tumors has to do with how its effect is on the entire body. Whereas the World Health Organization grading system is the aggressiveness of the tumor within the central nervous system. So a grade one tumor would be a more discreet, meaning well-defined, easy to identify tumor that is not very aggressive and usually cured with removal. A grade two is a little bit more aggressive in the fact that it's a little bit more invasive into the tissue around it, but the activity of the tumor, which we call mitotic activity, is not as aggressive as higher grades. So um, it's not a cancer, but it's a little bit more aggressive than a grade one. A grade three, which is what we call a more, uh, we call it a malignant grade or malignant tumor, is not necessarily what we would call also a cancer, but it just means it's very aggressive, very active. A grade four, which is typical of something that you hear called a glioblastoma, is a very aggressive form of cancer, which is very difficult to treat with you know, surgery, chemotherapy, radiation. So most brain tumors do show up on an MRI. There's, there's two ways to answer this question. The first is, is, you know, what type of tumor is it? Most tumors will show up on an MRI as long as there is contrast enhancement in it. So when you get an MRI, you can get a non-contrast MRI, which might be very difficult to see a brain tumor or a spinal cord tumor. However, with the addition of contrast, most tumors you can see. That means they show up bright white. However, there are exceptions to that. There are some very high grade cancers that don't necessarily enhance, but there are sequences within an MRI that are targeted to look at changes within the brain that we can see that, um, that are a little bit more subtle. So not all tumors are created equal. Therefore, there are many sequences on the MRI that are geared specifically to look at those uh, subtleties. Absolutely. So a brain tumor can affect your personality in two different ways. The first is a brain tumor does not have to affect any function. Sometimes tumors, depending on where they are and what they're touching, cause no symptoms at all. And you know, people die and, and they're found on autopsy and they never knew. Whereas some tumors can affect your personality two ways, like I said. First is that if it's sitting in and around your frontal lobe and causing a lot of compression of your frontal lobe or swelling of your frontal lobe, that area of your frontal, node, uh, frontal lobe affects your personality. So I've had many, many patients who are treated for various conditions, psychological conditions or depression or develop anxiety or just personality changes that once we remove the tumor and the swelling goes down, they recognize that those changes that they were seeing were affecting their personality. The second way a tumor can affect someone's personality is if a tumor is causing vision loss or a weakness in an arm or a leg, or it's causing hearing loss, just by having to deal with that alone really changes someone's personality. So I think what you were looking for is actually affecting the personality organically, and that's if usually there's frontal lobe compression or swelling. So absolutely, we see it often. So yes, it, it, the, the most simple answer, the way that smoking affects your brain is that smoking causes damage to the blood vessels. So think of your blood vessels a lot like you would think of a pipe or a straw. So there are blood vessels inside of our body that are very thin and narrow, similar to a coffee stirrer. There are blood vessels in our body that are bigger, thicker, like a, a straw that you would sip out of like a McDonald's cup or something. When, when you smoke, the smoking itself causes damage to the inside of the straw, the inside of the blood vessel. And it kind of as if it's like sandpaper to the inside of the vessel, it causes damage to it. When the inside of a blood vessel gets damaged, the red blood cells, the platelets, they stick to that area and it causes a buildup, kind of like pipes getting clogged or imagine trying to sip through a straw where there's something stuck in it, it doesn't go as well. 
So smoking can lead to blood vessel damage, which can lead to terrible things like stroke. So um, of course, there's other ways that smoking, smoking can cause the, can cause general brain damage, but the way that it does that is through the blood vessels. Ah, so the part of the brain that, call, uh, that controls your mood is something called the limbic system. Um, the limbic system has, um, has an organ in it called the amygdala, and that is directly responsible for your emotions and your, and your memories. Same. So the, the part of your brain that controls your memory is, is also the amygdala. Um, there's also another small organ in front of it called the hippocampus, hippocampus and um, parts of your cerebellum as well. So um, it's mostly the limbic system that controls things like, uh, like your, your, your memory and um, mood. So that's called the cerebellum. When we're younger and we're going through science class and things like that, you think of your cerebrum is like your brain, your big brain. And then you hear the term cerebellum is your mini brain. And your mini brain is a, is a small part back here that sits in the back of your head. And um, there's two lobes of it. And if there is any compression or swelling or a tumor in that, and that's pushing on that area, um, the symptoms that the patients feel is usually a change in balance and coordination. So there are two types of speech. There's what we call receptive speech and expressive speech. So speech is really intricate. In order for speech to work, you have to understand what someone is saying to you if you're having a conversation. So you need to receive the information and then you need to be able to verbalize appropriately back. So um, if someone has disruption in their speech, it could be their ability to understand the words coming into them or and or it could be the ability for the appropriate words to come back. And um, there are two areas of the brain that control that. Um, it's called Wernicke's and Broca's area. And an interesting fact about that is most of our population is right-handed, which means the left temporal lobe is responsible for that. So it's, it's opposite. So if a patient were to have a tumor or a bleed, in their left temporal lobe, and they happen to be right-handed, it will most likely be affecting their speech. So the, the part of your brain that controls your sense of touch is um, your parietal lobe. The parietal lobe is responsible for your ability to understand your, your spatial awareness. And so um, the ability to you know, be able to, to see something, touch it appropriately, and have that sensation come back, that's your parietal lobe. And so now separately. So the part of a brain that controls your sense of smell and taste, so that's a little bit differently. So your olfactory nerves, which is a cranial nerve, a nerve that runs along the um, anterior skull base, kind of right behind the eyes, um, that actually receives the sense of smell. But your ability to actually interpret that information also comes from the parietal lobe. Okay. Eyesight is really intricate. So eyesight has to be, able, the information needs to be able to, to be received, which comes from the eyes itself. And there's an entire network system that interprets that information. So the eye itself will see the information and that information is gathered through a nerve called the optic nerve. The optic nerve is connected in the back of the eyeball. It then enters underneath the brain and crosses and connects fibers from the other eyeball. So they information comes from the eyeball, crosses underneath the brain. Those fibers then go back to the back of the head in a lobe called the occipital lobe, which then interprets the information. So it's a really intricate kind of highway system from the eyeball itself, underneath the brain, fibers into the brain, into the back of the head. The part of your brain that controls hearing is actually two parts. The first is, again, similar to eyesight. The, inf the information needs to come into the brain and then needs to be processed. So the uh, vestibulocochlear nerve, which is cranial nerve number eight, is the nerve which accepts the hearing through the ears. And then the information is then sent to the temporal lobe for processing and understanding. So the part of the brain that controls the digestive system is actually not necessarily a part of the brain, actually. It's a nerve called the vagus nerve. So the vagus nerve is, is a cranial nerve. It's a lower cranial nerve that comes out of the brain stem, and it controls the sympathetic 
nervous system and the body's ability to control digestion. So it's, it's more of a, a nerve than necessarily a part of the brain. What is pregnancy brain or how does pregnancy affect the brain? Well, that's a really good question with a whole lot of answers that would take a long time and a lot of healthcare providers to explain. But generally speaking, uh, you know, pregnancy brain usually just means that there's a lot of hormones that are racing and going up and going down during pregnancy, which are very different than the normal hormonal balance of a woman when she's not pregnant. And so our ability to interpret and live through those hormonal balances can make us feel different. It could make us feel moody or disinterested, aggressive, and it's all very normal. Um, however, if some of the moods are too high or too low, then it's really important to talk to your healthcare provider about it. Pregnancy can also affect your brain in many other ways. During pregnancy, the body changes very rapidly within nine or 10 months. The belly itself gets a lot larger. There's a lot of pressure on the veins within the body and that pressure actually gets signaled back up into the brain. And sometimes that can lead to increased pressure in the brain. It can lead to swelling of certain parts of the brain. For example, the pituitary gland, which is a normal gland that sits underneath the brain, kind of directly behind the nose it can get a little swollen during pregnancy. And um, some women can feel the effects of that. Um, pregnancy can also lead to something called a hypercoagulable state, which means the blood can thicken a little bit. So some women are more at risk for things like blood clots. So during pregnancy, the body can change quite a bit, can feel all sorts of different feelings and sensations. And so probably one of the most important things is that if during pregnancy, there are significant change in vision or new headaches that just don't go away. It's very important that you speak to your healthcare provider about that because there can be small, subtle changes in pregnancy that mean something bigger in the brain. However, most of the time it's just normal pregnancy. When people think about neurosurgery, it's, it's very common to think about a neurosurgeon a man or a woman surgeon who is taking care of a brain or spine problem. However, it's very common in the specialty of neurosurgery for there to be advanced practice providers. Advanced practice providers are nurse practitioners and physician assistants collectively forming a term called advanced practice providers. We are healthcare providers. I am a physician assistant. I work with many other physician assistants in neurosurgery as well as nurse practitioners. We are dedicated, licensed healthcare providers that can examine patients, diagnose patients, and manage patients, getting them into surgery, managing them before and after surgery, as well as everything that needs to happen or get coordinated with any follow-up or surveillance. So just like if you were to go see your primary care doctor or go to a walk-in clinic and see a physician assistant or nurse practitioner for a sore throat, and then maybe get examined with a throat culture and get diagnosed with strep throat. You can also see a physician assistant or, neuro, or uh, neurosurgery nurse practitioner that can also see you, evaluate you, and get you in the right direction to see if surgery or surveillance is needed. Physician assistants and nurse practitioners can prescribe medications. We can prescribe medications similar to our doctors. There's really no limits on the medicines that we can prescribe. However, there are some controlled substances that we would need special certification for similar to medical doctors.